Now, what, what's your perspective on the cause of cancer or cause is, I should probably should say. Sure, sure. Well, we've been under this belief system and a medical system that really surrounds it of cancer is um, a, a disease of bad luck, a disease mm. of the aging, that it's a genetic disease or what's known as a somatic mutation disease. In fact, we've been following this path of somatic mutation theory since 1914. Dr. Theodore Bovary is who sort of put that into the world around us. And um, that has where we've put all of our energy, all of our money, all of our research, and it really picked up momentum in the 1950s with Watson and Crick finding the DNA helix. And so that's where we put our energy, despite the fact that our research suggests that this is not, in fact, a genetic disease, or at least that's not the starting point that we're being taught. So I'll get an example of how we've learned that is we've had multiple studies, multiple repeated studies over many decades that's, that looks at something called a DNA, a nuclear transfer study. So basically think about having two cells, one cell that's a healthy cell, one cell that's a cancer cell. And then in that side, that cell is a little like hard drive, right? It's the nuclei. It's where the, 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 the genetic material is stored. And so if this was truly a genetic disease, we could take the nuclei out of the cancer cell and replace the nuclei of the healthy cell. And if this was genetic, we would turn that cell into a cancer cell. Vice versa, if we took that healthy nuclei out of the healthy cell and we replaced the nuclei of the cancer cell, we should be able to correct and return that cell into a healthy cell. That doesn't happen. Mm. But what people like Dr. Mina Bissell, all the way from the 1980s and many, many others, uh, researchers along the way have found is it's sort of like what that nuclei, that hard drive is sitting in. What's it floating in? So that's the cytoplasm, the, the jelly, the swimming pool within the cell. But even more specifically, the organelles that are in charge of what we initially thought we're just in charge of making ATP, just in charge of making energy. Those are our mitochondria. And we thought those little buggers were just about making energy, but we've since learned that they're a, a sensing organ, that they are right. actually taking in all the information around them, food, light, um, you know, toxins, medications, thoughts, uh, you know, what, like all the things that's taking it in, this beautiful receiver, this beautiful antenna, it's making sense of that information and then sending signals out into the body. So that is where we're really seeing that when those get damaged, when they get sluggish or gummed up or, or damaged or killed off, we then become more susceptible to DNA damage. Those can be problematic. So that's something for folks to keep in mind. And then interesting, they're in charge entirely of apoptosis, programmed cell mm -hmm. death. So when they do sense that there's some damaged cells or deranged metabolic processes happening in some of the cells, they should respond to them and help clear them out of the building. All right, so that's where things start to go awry and where things like cancers take place. And then in, even more interesting in all of the field, people are spending billions of dollars a year on longevity and anti-aging products and anti-aging medicine. And the craziest part is our longevity is 100% dependent on the health and wealth of our mitochondria. Hmm. And that is where we make the link between cancer and longevity and the mitochondria and all of this is because basically you can have cancer and thrive with cancer. You, you weren't thriving hmm. until you realized you had cancer, but once you've learned you have cancer, you can turn that around and thrive with cancer and change this out because that's where your longevity is going to be coming from is you're tending to the health and wealth of those mitochondria. So that means whether you have cancer, whether you have other chronic illnesses, you want to focus your attention on priming and supporting and creating resilience and regeneration of your mitochondria. And this is why we're having this conversation and the dozens and dozens of guests that you have coming on talking about this over and over of the simple things we could do to make those mitochondria hum. Yeah, that's good. It's a common link behind really all chronic degenerative diseases is some sort of mitochondrial dysfunction. The mitochondria are not turned on not properly expressing themselves, or in, or in a sense, I guess you could say they are properly expressing themselves for the environment that they're in. They've adapted. It's an adaptive physiology, yes. but that adaptive physiology isn't 
set up for your long-term health. And so you need to, in a sense, change the environment so that way those mitochondria now readapt to help promote long-term health. Exactly. And that's what I think is so cool is when you change what's happening inside the cell and the cytoplasm, you change what's happening at that mitochondrial level and the um, mm. rep cycle pathways um, yeah. that are processes happening within those little organelles, you can change the response to many therapies. You can change the response to epigenetic turning on and turning off processes. You can change and upgrade your resilience and your preventative mechanisms, but you can also upgrade your response and your just support of the treatment of, yeah. of those mechanisms. And I think that there's, that's where people get, they freak out and they're like, okay, we have to throw everything at it that we can. And sometimes that's standard of care. Sometimes that's chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, targeted therapies, endocrine blocking therapies. Sometimes that's hyperbaric oxygen, high dose IV vitamin C, you know, all these other therapies, those are all oxidative in nature. Mm. They strongly kick up oxidative stress and the, 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 the little creatures that have to deal with that are your mitochondria. So you can even overly do it with alternative therapies, which I actually see often as well, not just in the standard of care therapies. And so I want your listeners to realize we need to be a lot more nuanced and a lot more, I guess, like just delicate about the way we approach this, thinking a bit more as a dance, this concept of adaptive theory. I love that you talked about that versus maximum tolerated dose theory of mm. how do we push back just enough that our own body can swirl in and do what it was divinely designed to do, to take care of those mitochondria, to then take care of whatever diseased condition one is facing. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's a different approach because again, when people get something like cancer, usually it's the, it's the nuclear bomb approach, right? It's it's drop the bomb, you know, kill it as much as possible, and then rebuild from okay. there. What you're saying is it's more of the the, the gradual nudge kind yeah. of nudging in the right direction yeah. uh, or a, like a diplomacy if we're thinking about like, uh -huh. you know, instead of the nuclear bomb, right? Good diplomacy yeah. Yeah. and good conversation to create more peace in the body. I love that. That's that's gorgeous. That's, I've never uh, heard it stated that way, but I think that is a very beautiful and elegant uh, approach. And And for me personally, that just seems so much more hopeful as well. And that yeah. does something to our genetics. That does something to the, the health and vitality of our mitochondria when you're coming at it from a place of hope, of joy, of gratitude, of curiosity, mm. of purpose versus of fear of I must kill, eradicate, go to battle with. Even the very monikers we use to deal with this. I mean, the war on cancer was initiated in 1971. We're almost 52 years into that process now. And we are, and that, that idea in mind, you came out of a war time, right? We were coming yeah. out of the Vietnam war and we really, it was such a, uh, the ethos of our times globally that that's what people could relate to. And yet we're also living in a time now where polarities are causing us much harm. This era of despair is causing us so much harm and this disconnectedness, maybe connected more than ever with online, but lonelier than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a sign of our times that perhaps that's the angle in which we want to approach it is leaving behind the outdated and antiquated war model and moving more into this place of compassion and understanding.